struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm sitting here today with Carl Demilig. Carl, how are you today? Outstanding. How are you doing, Travis? I'm doing fabulous. You know, it's the 17th of May. I don't know if this is coming out until probably October, but I just walked in and got my master's two days ago. Uh, so Carl works with Guardian Angel Advisors. Why don't you give us a little bit of background on Guardian Angel Advisors? Sure. First of all, the theme is vague. You know, what is a guardian angel? Oh, someone that just comes out of nowhere to help you with a problem that you it hurts enough, but not enough for you to actively do something. So when I first created it, the scope was broad and it follows my journey as an entrepreneur. The first one was getting out of college with student loans, trying to start a business. I graduated as a chiropractor and that's not a cheap school. So I started a business with student loans and had to learn, how am I gonna do this? Because my student loans are this much a month, I have overhead. So this, that's the first phase of Guardian Angel Advisors. It's, it's a alternative business finance suite of services. So phase one, I call it, is student loan repayment strategies. How do I structure my income so that I can reduce my monthly payments on student loans funnel it back into my business so that the business can grow more money. And originally that was just something I kept to myself because I was so focused on the business that I didn't make student loan strategies a business. It wasn't until later when about a decade, I had some injuries come back from the Marine Corps that prevented me from doing chiropractic work. And it was kind of heartbreaking because I just spent years and lots of money becoming a chiropractor that I realized I may have to give this up. And then I realized, well, I live in the San Francisco Bay area. Now, if I give this up, if I can do a business where I can work from anywhere virtually or even from home, why would I want to live in a state that tax my state income? And that was the beginning of my journey into understanding the tax code. So I got up and left. I moved to another state that does not have state income tax, started a financial services type business. I learned how insurance work, life insurance, and that's when I learned about tax-free income. But I also wanted to learn more about the whole tax code. By the way, I'm not also an attorney. I don't have time to do all that. So I'm not giving tax advice or anything like that. But as I got into learning more about finance and taxes, I had to start a new business and this time I wanted to do it not with my own money, but with business credit where the credit is built upon the EIN of the business, not dependent on my personal credit score. So I got into business credit along with life insurance, understanding taxes and my natural curiosity just got me to learn what do these people who you don't know, you don't hear about, how are they navigating the tax code because I've always been taught that there's there's two types of information. There's the public information that is fed to you through TV, the show itself, and the commercials, and then ads, brochures, and just once we're generally marketed to everybody. And I thought that I'm sure these wealthy families have information passed to them at the country club or their yacht clubs that they don't share with everyone else. And Somehow I met someone who, by the way, that yeah, phase two was the business credit. So you can start a business not dependent on your own personal credit. And then phase three was, well, now that you are stable in your business and you are okay with giving back to the community, what's the, what's the most efficient way where you can either just donate money, maybe not so much time, but how, what's the most efficient way you can donate money and that even if after you die, Money is still going to the causes you care about. And that's when I met someone who introduced me to the world of private, non-operating foundations run by your family only. And that changed the game when I, when I learned about that side of the tax code. I was like, so that's how those people do it. That's how they can legally reduce their income tax. Everyone can when they do a charitable donation, but also eliminate capital gains tax on their investments like stocks and real estate. 
Yeah, because they're owned by the foundation, right? Yes, they're owned by the foundation. And let's say you have stocks that are, let's just say you're earning 10% a year without capital gains tax. That essentially, that private non-operating foundation as a bank of assets, that's going to grow much faster than an individual who pays capital gains tax and income tax, things like that. And the private foundation's goal, one, is to exist for as long as it can, grow the assets without paying capital gains tax. But two, a little bit has to be donated every year to these public charities. Not too much so that you're whittling down the assets, but enough so that it, it's charitable. So I mentioned earlier that it's controlled by your family. So imagine you're, I don't know, 50 years old. You have kids, maybe they're half your age, 25. They're watching you as the parent run this foundation donating every year, they're picking this up from you about hey, every year, let's go find a new cause to support. And when you decide to no longer run this foundation, you pass it on to your kids, they take over the reins, they can come up with their own causes to support. But the point is, even after you, let's say you retire, if you didn't have a foundation, chances are your donations would decrease to the causes you care about because you have less money. But then two, when you pass away, no more donations probably. However, if the foundation's still around and carried on by your kids, you're still giving money every year to causes that your family cares about. And that would be like phase three, the uh, phase three of the entire business finance suite that uh, Guardian Angel Advisors offers. So that's a very different setup to look at a private foundation versus a public charity. You know, it sounds like to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you have this all internal to your family. You guys are making the decisions. You are deciding what to do as opposed to a public charity, the standard 501c3. You've got a founder that's fired up about a cause. He creates this entity. They get their 501c3 tax status. They now report to a board of directors is responsible for the, to the community for executing the mission. And you as the founder have no real power, um, depending on you know what kind of person you are, how you behave, because if you get out of line, your board can then vote you off the island and your baby that you created and you started and you grew is no longer yours. You have nothing to do with it and you have no control. Whereas a private foundation, a private family foundation, you can do whatever the heck you want. You can give as little or as much as you want to, to whatever charity or cause that you assume is worthy. Does that sound right? That's correct. And I'd say another benefit of doing it this way, when I mean doing it this way, is passing down assets for your family to manage, is if you just did this as a family trust where your children inherit, let's just say you have a million in a uh, family trust, they could spend that million on themselves, on something silly, Whereas if it's a million in a private foundation, it has to go to charity. So they're not buying themselves for coats or things like that or classic cars. They could, however, support a classic car museum, buy a 64 and a half Ford Mustang and still have use of it because the purpose is to support the promotion of uh, classic automobiles. That could be a charitable cause, but you don't own it. It's, it's owned by the foundation and it's for charitable use to you know, have a museum. So it's a, it's a nice way to keep it, the mindset of it's not ownership, it's stewardship. We're keeping this to pass on to the next generation. I don't want to own anything. I want to be a steward so the next generation that's on this planet gets to enjoy what it is. That's what museums are as well. I, I don't know. I, I blacked out when you said I could go buy a fancy car, have it owned by a museum, but then I also get to use it. So <laughs> you're like hmm, what do i want <laughs> i've been i've been thinking about this for like the last week like because i'm like you know what what happens if i you know make it big and i can just afford to buy whatever i want i really there's nothing i really want as an individual like i've got everything i need i don't have any wild and crazy dreams of owning a yacht or my own private airplane or you know any of these things like i don't I don't care. I'm pretty simple, straightforward guy. But I've always had this interest in classic cars where, you know, oh, like that looks cool. Or when I was like, drive that one. I, I don't want to buy one because then you're stuck with one. So I've been trying to imagine throughout the last week, how can I create something that's like a service where you can get 
like a different classic car every week. You know what I mean? Like, what does that look like? But now we're talking about a private foundation. It sounds like I could have that in theory. I know I'm joking a little, a little bit because I obviously it wouldn't be for charitable use. It'd be for Travis's own fun time, but that's such an interesting way to look at that. I was told that there was, I forget who, I don't know the person's name. So this is really just a rumor. He had a, I think he may have had a public charity and it had classic cars. Part of what he promoted was raising gentlemen. So he would allow those cars to be used by a local high school for prom, where they would also teach the, the men how to properly put on a suit. And, you know, it would be driven by, you know, not the high schoolers. But that's how they showed up to prom is classic cars, classic tux. And that was what they did for the charity. So that because it was the purpose of the charity, it was allowed to buy these cars for that purpose. Okay. Now I have my, my goal in life is to start a charity to help young gentlemen and also to have really cool cars. <laughs> yeah, they, they almost go hand in hand. I remember not knowing how to use cufflinks. I, I, I was fascinated like a barrel cuff. No, anyway, that's off topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we just get a little bit off topic on the show and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's, that's so interesting that you can set up private foundations. Like is, I mean, do you have to be like a family foundation or are organizations or different types of businesses? Are they creating their own foundations as well? There are foundations created by corporations and I don't know of any of them personally. I just know their names. My guess is that you can get up to a 30% charitable donation deduction when you donate to a foundation. So I'll just say X corporation, let's say it makes 3 billion in profits. It, it can donate up to 30%, get a charitable donation deduction. And then, then from there in their foundation, they can start supporting causes and doing something called corporate social responsibility. Oh yeah, I'll bring up Jersey Mike's. I believe they have a corporate owned uh, foundation. And every month there's like a day of the day of giving where all sales from that day get donated and it goes through their foundation because I'm sure there's, they're maximizing their tax benefits. So corporate foundations are one way. There are community foundations and then uh, family foundations. So you won't find the phrase family foundation in the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, I, I call it that because that's what my community calls it. It's 100% operated by your family. And there's a particular way to do that. Uh, most people, when they create a 501c3, they first go to their state and do a articles of nonprofit incorporation. And depending on the state, it'll say you have to have three board members, five board members, and then it'll say something like two thirds cannot be family. Now, if I'm if my family is donating, getting that thirty percent charitable donation deduction every year, I would hate to be kicked out of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking right now at Jersey Mike's website and they have their culture of giving and their foundation. They exactly what you said. They have a day of giving where a hundred percent of sales are donated. And since 2011, so we're coming up on 10 years here, they've raised $47 million for their foundation. It's because of that, that I pick them over just about every other sandwich shop nearby. One, yes, their sandwiches are fantastic and filling, <laughs> but two, they, they give away, they, they have their charitable causes. So the, I really like that. Yeah, it seems like with the social responsibility we have today and, and the creative ways people are giving back, uh, with just a little bit of Google time, you can find and help decide between, you know, two or three companies, which one you're going to utilize, depending on if you're looking at something like Walmart, if you care about something like Jersey Mike's or even your local sports team. I know you're out in Vegas and the Golden Knights, the hockey team, they have a foundation as well. Right, right. I would love to meet them. <laughs> it, it's, it's so interesting that the different ways that people can interact with uh, charitable type services. Uh, I was kind of joking with my dad earlier. We were talking about the differences between you know, Democrats and Republicans and some different ways they look at things. Um, this, of course, doesn't apply to everybody, but it seems that the left is more interested in having the government take a little bit from everybody to help provide some services. And the right seems to be a little bit more charity focused. And of course, 
I want to have people calling into Travis. That's not true at all. I'm on the left and, or I'm on the right. And I believe that this obviously doesn't apply to everybody, but really when I look at the, the charitable word world, it's like, if I'm going to, I don't know, pick, pick a tax for myself, someone I'm going to you know give to, uh, I don't, I don't want to give it to the government because I want to give it to an organization that I really care about. You know, if I am a, a single dad and it was nearly impossible for me to fight for rights to have my kids, there's organizations out there, there's charitable organizations that provide legal services to single dads trying to get custody of their kids. And because, you know, I cared about that, I can specifically funnel my money to this cause to help that group of people, whether it's education or what have you, there's a way to do it in the nonprofit world to get specifically drilled down, laser focused on the cause that you want to help instead of just giving a blank check to the government and hopefully they're, they're going to use it responsibly. That's one of the strategies I tell my clients. And, and um, actually, let me finish up on the family foundation part. Either you can go to the state and get a non articles of nonprofit incorporation where you're a minority decision maker, or B, you create a charitable trust, bypass the state, and then go to the IRS to get your 501c3 letter. And on that letter, it will say you are further subclassified as either a public charity or private foundation. And based on how you answer the questions on the 1023, you'll get a private foundation. And so, uh, what I recommend to my clients when they're talking about tax strategy, I talk to them about taxes, you know, and again, I'm not a tax attorney, but I say, let's say you have an adjust, let's say you're a business owner, you have an adjusted gross income of $200,000 after all your business deductions. And I pick 200,000 because that's the 32% tax bracket. Now, if you did not have a private foundation, you're going to be paying 32% in a 32% bracket. And I believe that is $52,000 because it's graduated. And that's $52,000 that just went to the IRS. It did not go to the local community. But if you have a private family foundation, you can take your 30% charitable donation deduction, which is $60,000. So now you have 140 taxable. Now you're in the 28% tax bracket. And that is, I think, $35,000 of income tax. Now you might think, well, 35,000 and 60,000, I just lost control of. No, just the 35,000. The other 60,000 is in your private foundation. Grow your assets tax-free in there and donate it to one or more causes that you care about year after year and even after you retire. Let's say you don't make 200 grand anymore. Let's say you're happy with 50. You have this private foundation with money that's been growing for a decade or two you can continue to give even after you retire. And then when you pass it on to your kids, they continue to give to the causes. So that's a great way to repurpose taxes. And again, have it to go to places that you care about. That's uh, one of the biggest pain points people have is, you know, I could, my family's wealth would get further ahead, whether we're stewards through a private foundation or otherwise we'd get, we'd get ahead faster if we weren't handicapped by income tax and capital gains tax. So it's so, a, Great strategy to use. Oh, definitely. I I just applied for retirement. And one of the things I'm looking at is which states can I live in where they're not going to tax my military retirement income and what that might look like or what states don't have a, a state tax in general. I'm in Oklahoma currently. And right now, the first 20% of your retirement income is not taxed. If I go south to Texas, all of a sudden I have no income tax. And if I don't own property there, because all of their taxes are collected through property tax, if I'm not a property owner there, but I just live there and rent, I would pay no property tax and no income tax. Of course, if I get something like 100% disability status, I don't pay taxes no matter where I'm at. So that's the first goal for me. But you know, leveraging and, and not having to pay taxes is huge. Uh, I know we just mentioned, you know, family foundations, but I'm looking through here at the list of corporations that have foundations. Um, everyone seems to have a foundation. Wells Fargo's got a foundation, Bank of America, Walmart, JP Morgan, GE, City, Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil, all of these people have their own foundation. And I imagine it's for the same reasons that we're talking about, lowering their taxable income, their tax hit. Uh, everyone on this top 50 list is, is people that we've heard of. And if the big guys are doing it, there seems to be a way 
that we as the little guy can do that and take advantage of the tax breaks. I, I do hope you're not trying to become 100 percent disabled. That's, that's not a good no, no, way. no. If no. I if if I'm not trying, right? But if my medical record supports that, I want to ensure that I get the rights that are afforded to me. My goal would be to get be a zero percent disabled, to have no problems when I leave the military. Uh, but that is just not how it works. <laughs> People are like, oh, you're fighting for this. I'm like, well, if if I've earned it. All right. And me and me getting that status uh, doesn't take away from anybody else. It's not like if I get it, someone else doesn't get it. But if, if that uh, is what's determined uh, out of all the options available, there's many more advantages being at that 100 percent than being at 40 percent or 70 percent. And the goal is really would be to leave with no problems in the military, that my back would be feeling great, that, you know, you don't have PTSD or sleep apnea or any of these other problems that arise during military service. But as I'm saying this, I'm looking over at my CPAP machine that I sleep with each and every night. I know that's an automatic 50%. So uh, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. But if I'm going to be tagged as a disabled veteran, I might as well get the one with the most benefits for me. Right. Yeah, you earned it. And back to those list of foundations. I mean, what are the chances that everyday people like me and you are going to meet board members of those corporations? They're not going to share that information with us. I did want to bring this up. I do have a client or a prospect. They love animals and they would love to start maybe a small animal refuge. So I said, did you know a private foundation could own a ranch if it's part of its charitable purpose? Because really, said, and in most counties, private foundations don't pay property tax. She said, oh, <laughs> now she might want to add horses. You know, it's, <laughs> there's a, um, Basically, that's just what you said about 100% and no property tax. I'm like, well, there's another strategy that you could benefit from the private foundation. But uh, one thing I love, though, is that because it's in trust form, when you want to change the mission or expand the mission, you all you have to do is meet with your fellow trustees, who, by the way, are going to be your family members, and vote on it. If you were to do this again as a state nonprofit corporation, you'd have to meet with your board of directors. And if they approve it, then you have to go to the state, request permission to change the mission, and hopefully you don't get kicked out by your fellow board members. It's a different world, and I'm glad I, it got shared with me. I mean, it's very interesting. You know, so many people, especially military members, they they leave and they want to start their own business. They want to start their own for-profit business or non-profit business, and um, they really want to do something and do some some good. And when I bring up the fact that you know, a 501c3, they don't own the organization. They're like, well, I'm not sure if I want to do it then. Well, you ask, you ask honest kind of gut level questions like, well, is it about you or is it about the mission? If it's about you, then you shouldn't start one no matter what you what, what we're talking about here. If it's about the mission, then you understand that it's not going to have your name on it. And it's going to be all right to do whatever it needs to do. I mean, your time is done there. You're going to move on. It's no big deal. But if it's going to be about you, then creating your own nonprofit organization is just not the way to go. Right. It sounds like if it's about you, make as much as you can so you can donate as much as you can. Yeah. It's going to be better if you're earning money at your, at your primary business. There's been all these different studies about people that go out and get MBAs and a good portion of them join nonprofit organizations and they're working as an executive director. Uh, depending on the size of the organization, you know, making up to, you know, maybe eighty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year, where their classmates or counterparts are out in the corporate world making, you know, two fifty to four hundred thousand dollars a year. So you can go out, make four hundred thousand dollars, donate a hundred thousand dollars, be considered a philanthropist. You're still bringing in three hundred k, which is two, you know, public math here, right? Two hundred twenty thousand ahead of the person that's doing full time nonprofit work. So who's better off? Who's worse off? I don't know, but it, it definitely brings up a, a question of, you know, the pay scale and what people are doing in the nonprofit world as opposed to doing in the business world. You know, what what provides the greater impact? What has the better feel good? And if you're in more and more of these uh, B Corps are popping up where their huge mission uh, whatever they're doing, and they have a huge part of that that's attached to some sort of charity work, giving back. So, you know, which one is better than the other one? You, you can't say, but there's definitely more money in one than the other. And 
you know, that comes down to some of your decision making. If you're in a business, you're owning it as opposed to just being a name on a form somewhere that has no real power and it's not really something that you own. So to tie that back into the student loan strategies I mentioned in the beginning, that's why the government incentivized public service work. They created a program called Public Service Loan Forgiveness for those who have federal student loans and work for government or 501c3. So normally you have up to 25 years in an income driven repayment plan to pay it off. And after that, the balance is forgiven, but the, the, the forgiven balance is taxes income because it was a loan you didn't repay. But the public service loan forgiveness allows it, you as a full-time employee of a 501c3 or government to only have to repay your loans for 10 years. And after that, what is left is forgiven without income tax. So the government's incentivizing work that way. Yes, we, we know typically it pays less, but hey, if you're going to have to pay 15 years, you know, less, you know, and of lesser amount and less time, if it's going to save you this much money, that's where you got to balance the math. So it's a, it's a great program for people to take advantage of if they have a sizable balance. Yes. And uh, just so everyone is, is forewarned, I'm about to go off on a tangent about uh, student loans. I don't think there's ever a time that you should take a student loan. And I'm going to caveat this real quick by saying I'm about to teach you how to do it for free. Right now in the U.S., there is a dozen schools that don't charge tuition. Look them up. They're all over the U.S. They never charge tuition. Go to those schools. You can still get an education. The vast, vast majority of people don't care where you went to school or what your degree is in, as long as you have a degree. All of the military academies are free, and that's Ivy League education. ROTC programs, you can get ROTC and go to Yale for free. Speaking of Yale and Ivy League schools, it is income-based tuition. If you make under 45, everything is free, including the meal program, room and board, tuition, Everything is covered. If you make less than 60, it's tuition free. 60 to 120 is graduated based income, tuition based on how much your parents make. And then over 120, you're paying full prices. There is a couple dozen companies in the US that they pay for you to go to school Home Depot, Lowe's, Starbucks, Walmart, McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed Martin, all the aviation companies pay for your college. Go work for someone that's going to pay for your college including the military, which is where I got my free school. Hey, you don't like any of those options? Go to Europe. There's a dozen countries over there that you don't have to be a citizen and they teach in English and it's free. You, oh, I've already got my advanced degree. I want a doctorate. What do I do? Go to Sweden. Sweden has free doctoral programs. Beyond that, just real quick, every year there's about $400 million in unused scholarships. You're like, but Travis, how do I find it? I fill out my FAFSA and my Pell. That's great. There's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of other scholarships available. And if you download apps like FastWeb, Scholly, which is S-C-H-O-L-L-Y, or scholarships.com, you put in your demographics and it spits out a big list of opportunities for you. It's not back in the day where you had to go to the library, grab a big dusty old book, go through there, find one that you might qualify for, write them on paper and a letter. A lot of these things don't even require paper papers anymore or they have video submissions so you just pop on your camera and phone start recording and go and hit submit a lot of these you can do during your lunch hour or right after school submit two three five ten a day there's no limit me as a white guy military veteran getting my master's i qualified for 85 scholarships on fast web put in your demographics hit go, hit search, start applying today. I had one of my daughter's friends, my daughter's getting ready to graduate here in three days from high school. Uh, one of her friends was interested and she's like, oh, I can't afford college. We brought up some apps. This young lady has applied for 112 scholarships already. and She's already been awarded 40 of them. Don't let this 18 year old girl outwork you. Don't sign up for loans without trying other options. There's so many other options available to you. You don't have to worry about student loan forgiveness if you never took out a loan in the first place. All right, back to our <laughs> back to our real conversation here. I will say that there are very few degrees you that you will need actual schooling for. And these are the technical things like engineer, healthcare. But yeah, for the most part, School of Hard Knocks can teach you way more than a textbook. Dr. Laura Dennis, engineer. 
Beyond that, it's some kind of technical technical or certification or apprenticeship program. Everything else is just kind of you're going to learn just because you want to learn. But most of them don't need specific degrees. No one, no, uh, as far as I know, and I could be wrong here, there's not a single employer out there that says, you know what, I want you to have a degree in gender studies. That's what we're needing from you. Got to have a gender studies degree to be employed here. I don't think that exists. Am I wrong? There's definitely a chance I could be wrong. But as far as I know, there's not, a, there's not an employer out there like, you know what, we definitely need this. And right now, Google, they don't want people with degrees. They want people to build their business. And having a degree does not directly translate into them getting a better quality employee. They want you to have specific certifications. They want you to have a specific mindset. There's a reason they let you dedicate a day to work on whatever project you want to because they want to grow their business. I think that says a lot about <clears throat> Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, that they weren't so, and I hate to use the word indoctrination, but it's true, indoctrinated by the school system where it's memorize, regurgitate, and get your award, your grade. It's, it's really, there's no creativity in it. And it's just indoctrination to be a really good employee. So I, I think the best value that college would provide is probably the networking that you, you meet 40 people an hour every day that you're at school. And uh, that's something, you, again, you, if I were to do college again, I would network more. But uh, yeah, otherwise, I don't see a degree as absolutely necessary except for the technical things that you mentioned. Yeah. If you want to network, start your own podcast. Everyone wants to talk to you. They're happy when they talk to you. You leverage their audience when you promote a new episode because they promote it. And all of a sudden, all these people are trying to figure out who you are and what you do, and they want to talk to you. Networking through podcasting has been one of my uh, most fun things because I just love, love, love meeting new wonderful people like Carl. They're doing great things. And this is a way for me to do that. I'm probably never going to, well, actually, I'm going to go to Vegas later this year. I might even see you while I'm out there. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually the page I'm on in your, your um, podcast guidebook is that what you just said right there, that people will want to talk to you because they get, to, well, they get to talk about themselves and you learn from everyone, which I love doing. But I mean, the, the, one of the big secrets, people are like, wow, Travis, you know a lot. Well, every single person I talk to and every single person I interview, it's like my own private little master class. I didn't have to pay 20 grand for Carl's master class that he's going to start offering by the end of the year. I get to do this for free and ask Carl whatever the heck I want to ask him for my own personal benefit and, you know, benefit of my audience too. <laughs> yeah, share the info. It doesn't decrease the way like if you share apples, actually, yeah, that will multiply too if you do it right. Oh, absolutely. You provide value without expectation and then just hold on. Everything's coming for you. Sliding into our next topic here, you run it or you know of a thing. I don't know. I don't know how you're involved in this thing called dynamic pay. Tell us a bit more about dynamic pay and what that is. Sure. So this is a fundraising app, a digital sustainable fundraising app. And I got introduced to this before I got introduced to the world of private foundations. Um, but I, I kept it in the back of my, my mind because I know I'd be interacting with more public charities running a private foundation. And just to contrast, the public charity must get at least, I believe it's 33% of its funding from the public through fundraising activities. Uh, private foundations typically don't fundraise. So I don't use it for private foundations, but public charities, it's a great way to have, let's say you had 100 supporters. Your email list is 100 people. And you were just to tell them, hey, um, how much do you spend on stuff every month? Groceries, you know, Amazon's a big one. How often do you go to Applebee's, Five Guys, um, Whole Foods? Do you think you spend about 500 bucks a month on that stuff? And if they say yes, and I, I wrote the math down because I didn't memorize it. Uh, so let's say each supporter spends about 500 bucks a month on stuff through the stores that are in this app. And it's a digital app on your phone. The way it works is this is not a round up for charity. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh, you want to round up and the rest goes to charity. No, this is if you spend $43.12, you're only paying $43.12. Now, based on the store, they will pay a rebate between 2 to 15%. And you as the user of the app, you get to choose how much of that rebate between 2 to 15%. How much of that do I want to keep and how much do I want to share with my favorite nonprofit? 
So let's go back to the $500 example. Let's say they spend 500 bucks a month and the average rebate is 5%. Now, me as a user, I want some of the rebate. So let's say I'll keep 75% of the rebate and I'll donate a quarter of the rebate. So that means 500 bucks, rebate of five, I'm sharing 25% of that. That means every month, just by buying what I already buy, that's a donation of $6.25 a month per person using the app. So if you have 100 supporters, that's $625 on stuff people are buying anyway. And it is a, uh, it's an annual membership to use the app. It's like 25 bucks, 10 of that gets donated immediately to the charity. And throughout the year, just by buying groceries and going out to dinner, Italian dinners and pizzas on there, you're donating just because you took a little extra couple seconds to pay through the app instead of just swiping your card. So you get to support the cause. And the, by the way, the, the, it's branded at the top of your phone. Uh, right now, uh, I support a uh, veterans organization in Watsonville on the one that I have. And because it's digital, I can share this with the person I'm sitting with and say, hey, you want to help me support this cause here? Let me share this with you. Now they can download the app and it can go viral. So it's, it's a great touchless system. A lot of people are, you know, very cautious with the germs, but also certain places like Panera is a favorite of mine. I don't have to go talk to the person in front if I'm being antisocial or just in a rush. I'm going to buy my salad anyway. Why not donate a couple pennies, a couple dollars daily to a cause that I care about? That's really interesting. I know I did a interview with Isaac Belden and we talked about 12 B gives and he's the, the back end side, the credit card processor of the building, right? So Panera bread, for instance, changes their credit card processor over to 12 B gives you partner with an organization like your veteran organization out of Watsonville. Um, and a portion of every single swipe goes directly to that organization. But this is this is the mobile version of that. You as an individual, anywhere you go buy stuff, I'm not sure how this exactly works, that accepts dynamic pay or allows you to pay with other means. Every time you make a purchase anywhere you go, a portion of what gets processed then goes over to the nonprofit. And then if, I guess if you've got Amazon Smiles and you pay with dynamic pay, not only does Amazon pay a little chunk to the nonprofit, but then through dynamic pay, they get paid as well. So it's a great way to double up there, which is, I mean, let's be honest, that's pretty cool. So if you can get your tech savvy su supporters to download dynamic pay and it's dynamicpay.net, um, everything you're buying from no matter where you get it from goes and helps out the charity that you care most about. That's so cool. Yeah. Be sure to let them know that Carl sent you. I've been with the company for a couple of years in the background because I've been working mostly with private foundations. But if you are a public charity, and I think they're now offering it to chambers of commerce, uh, this is a great way to add funds to your organization passively and sustainably because people are going to buy groceries every month. They're going to go to Sam's Club and get gas, you know, things like that. Yeah, that's really cool. So we talked about private foundations. We talked about <laughs> how to go to college for free. You slip that in there. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't figure out how to pay back a loan. Figure out how to not get the loan in the first thinking place. Right. Um, absolutely. And then we talked about dynamic pay as a way to support podcasts or essentially each and every swipe from you as an individual, which is just a, such a cool way to to do things. What what is on the on the horizon for you? You're doing Garden Angel Advisors. You're on this dynamic pay. What else is on the horizon for you? Uh, a lot of it is just in support of the trustees that I help create their private foundations because they need to know how to run operations. And that's where most of my focus is. I had an epiphany, actually, I shouldn't say epiphany, through an organization called Bunker Labs. They have a program called Veterans Oh, with Dave Presidents. Berlin? Yes. Yeah. So we also hey, check out our, my interview with Dave Berlin. I think he's like interview number two. So I didn't sound as great as I do. I probably had no idea what I'm talking about. Definitely <laughs> check out our friend Dave Berlin in episode number two. Yeah, he's got his own podcast too, Dave Needs Business Podcast. Uh, but when I went to Bunker Labs, we were doing, it's called a business canvas. It's, it was basically a bunch of questions to ask yourself. What do you love doing? What are your resources? And this was at the time when I was promoting business credit. After I did that, I said, you know what? This doesn't really excite me nearly as much as private foundation. So I changed my focus 
the beginning of this year. And now I'm just focusing on that audience that wants to create a lasting charitable legacy for their family and their community. And that's pretty much I see where the rest of my life is going. Private foundations and then the financial strategies to help grow the wealth in the private foundations so they can give away more money. That's fantastic. Hey, Carl, do us a favor and let people know where they can find you, how they can get a hold of you. And if they're interested in starting their own private foundation, you know, how they're going to contact you. Sure. Thank you again, Travis. My name is Carl DeMilig and you can reach me at my website, guardianangeladvisors.com. Now advisors are spelled with an E, not an O. And there you'll find some information about the entire scope of the business suite that I mentioned, student loans, business credit, private foundation. So just click on the appropriate tab. And also if you click the foundations tab, you'll find a a link for the fundraising app. So if you wanted to reach out to me that way, that's another great way to do it. The email is info at guardianangeladvisors.com. Again, advisors with an E and not an O. And also back to the website, if you wanted to book a time to chat about any of these three topics, um, you can go ahead and book a link, book through the link on the website. That's fantastic. You can also find Carl, host of the Generational Entrepreneur Podcast on my website, nonprofitarchitect.org. Hop over to the Veteran Podcast Network and you will find Carl's show there as well. Thank you so much, Carl. Yeah, thank you for having me, Travis. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Architect. To listen to all our past shows, visit http colon forward slash forward slash nonprofitarchitect.org and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Thank you.